All right, good morning. Good morning, good morning. So other than the miss on earnings yesterday, there doesn't really seem to be a whole lot other than noise this morning. All this talk about what's going on out there isn't really coming through. Uh, Bank of England speaker, we're past that already. It could be a fairly quiet morning, all things considered. I mean, other than obviously, yes, the um, the misses are going to wobble the market a little bit, but they have had all night to fall down, and as we're going to be seeing here in a minute when we get to the charts um other than the immediate gut punch reaction uh the bleeding stopped i mean it's already starting to recover again so they're still unwinding the 75 basis points and pricing in a 50 basis point rate hike uh, this is a little bit of wishful thinking out of the market. You know, we continue to see really good numbers and the Fed doesn't want to see really good numbers, right? So um, some, depending, I, I need to kind of clarify that a little bit, right? We've had some really good numbers and then we've had some really bad numbers. In the current market environment, bad numbers are good for the market uh, because that means the Fed is doing their job when we're seeing bad numbers the Fed is accomplishing their goal and the market will very likely go up when we get bad numbers, right? And the other way around, when we hear good economic reports and good numbers coming out, then the market doesn't like that simply because it shows the Fed is going to have to do more, punish more, uh, bring the pain and ratchet it up to a higher level. And the market doesn't like that. But Right now, what's on the table is they're unwinding a 75 basis point rate hike in February, and they are pricing in a 50 basis point rate hike, not for February, excuse me, for December. So 50 basis in, in December seems overly optimistic. I think that, um, I think maybe somebody got into the eggnog a little earlier or something if they think we're getting 50 in December, but we'll see, right? For February, if we go from three to 375, and then we go from 375 to four point or 425, then as we come into February, four or five would be a 25% increase, uh, 20, 25 basis point increase. Seven, five would be a 50 and five would be 75. So what we're looking at 75 basis points for November, 50 for December, and 50 for um, for February at the moment. But it looks like they're beginning to unwind the 50 basis points and are pricing in a 25 basis point. So now we're talking 75, 50, 25. What are they? Okay. A little bit of that warm, fuzzy feeling, right? I don't think so. Bank of Canada today is going to have um, a little bit of news. I really don't expect it to rock the market too bad. We'll just kind of watch, you know, through the morning. 
keep your eye on Canada. There is an ETF that you can trade, right? That would um, give you access. Um, FXC, C is in kitty cat, I believe is the uh, ETF that you can trade for that. So if their numbers this morning are all out of whack, the if the pair continues to go down, then the ETF would go up, right? So you'd be long the ETF. I found it very odd that Bitcoin rallied last night when Microsoft and Google missed and dumped. But whatever, right? So we do have additional auctions today. Um, we're still kind of playing around near the front end of the curve, the two year and the five year. And we have the status report, which hopefully we're going to hear more about the uh, strategic petroleum reserve levels, kind of get an idea of where they sit and what the buying is going to look like to restock those levels. Maybe, you know, just looking for a little bit more information. All right, like it or not, we got a new higher high print, right? We closed outside of the box yesterday and actually held it even through the uh, the chaos after the earnings. So that is a higher high print. And in technical analysis, that would give us our first one, right? If you're looking for, you know, um, definitive cement ways of, you know, engaging in the market, starting with that higher high, higher low, it's, it's the very definition of trend, right? Uh, I had somebody say that we needed to keep it. We don't necessarily need to keep it now. We just now need to keep this higher low. That one's important, right? Because if we had to keep it, that would mean the market would never be allowed to pull back, right? And I mean, that, that's what markets do. They, they need to pull back and be healthy. But what we don't want it to do is pull back more than that. Right, so it now needs to hold above 3650 or things, uh, or that's bad, bad, just, just bad, don't do it. All right, turning on the moving averages for a moment so we can have the discussion of what's in front of us, what's around us. There's two orange lines. The orange lines are my 50. The reason that there are two is because I have the exponential and the simple. At some point, I just got tired of the whole debate of should you use the exponentials? Should you use the simple? You know what? Screw it. Just put them both on there. A lot of times they're going to overlap. There's no distinguishing difference between the two. And then other times they're not. So we made it through one of the 50s. We've still got the other 50 overhead. And it's basically a rejection point. We're a rally into the 50, into a descending, a sloping 50. Is very often going to be a rejection point, right? Just like um, it's more important with a sloping 200 a downward sloping 200, rally up into it, you take your rejection, you fade down, right? Um, the 50 is not as good as the 200 on that. But since we're on the daily instead of the weekly, then, you know, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take it. So we've got the MA pairs that form surge and momentum. We don't yet have trend 
obviously. So four above the 10 and price above both. 10 above the 20 and price above both. That gives us our surge and our momentum. And if you put those two together, then we have um, a market moving with momentum after a surge, some kind of language like that. We still want to keep track of how far away from the 10 we're getting. Um, and keep in mind that we do have that 50 overhead to be to be dealt with, right? It's at 3870 right now. Depending on the platform that you use, you might not be able to plot those on the intraday chart the way you can on Thinkorswim. But these daily moving averages don't move around crazy fast, right? So you can use your drawing tool and just mark that level out and then check on it oh, about every hour or so and just make sure that your line is still lined up where that moving average is. That way, if you're on trade evade or something like that, and it does have a multiple time frame moving average trade of eight does, but I don't like it. It's, it's a piece of junk. Distance from the 10 period of moving average. You can see we got to that 3%. And that is just about where the normal reversal has been. You know, it's funny that technical analysis tells us that we should have been prepared and ready for a pause or a reversal. We didn't know it was going to be earnings that did it, right? It could have been anything, a narrative, something they talked about on Bloomberg. You know, the, a lot of times they'll just attach a meaning to something or a reason to something so for those places that say well i don't care what the news is i just trade what i see on the chart i mean i i get that argument right here was telling us that this was supposed to pull back or pause and that's what we got right so Another thing worth noting is how far down we came. You measure that distance and you plot an equal distance to the other side. Just like with RSIs and MACDs and things like that, whatever print you get on one side of the oscillator, you're going to get on the other side of the oscillator. Here's the ADR levels for the day. And you can see that we're basically sitting in the middle. The market's not quite sure if we're done yet. And you can see when I turn on the volume, we're very likely going to see lowered volume. That's my base case argument. I haven't looked yet, so we're going to find out together. But this appears really muted. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind when I see the price like this this morning is that we have a whole lot of unfinished business, right? When you think about it from the idea of a market that's made a lot of moves, it kind of implies that anybody who had trading to get done got it done, right? Joe gets the call. The boss says, hey, man, I need you to dump X amount of contracts. He spends the next four hours working through getting those contracts traded. But when there's no movement, kind of implies he hasn't got his job done yet. The IB is initial balance. It's measured from six at night until seven at night. It's like an open range. Only with an open range, we choose how long we want the open range to be. Five minute, 15, 30, one hour. I've used them all. I kind of like the 15, but there's no 
right or wrong to it. It's just an open range. But the IEB, we don't get to choose. It's a one hour open range. And when you have a very narrow IB, then you have a market that still has all of its powder, so to speak. It hasn't been detonated. It hasn't been used yet. It, it has the capacity to really make a move. And so far, we haven't made it yet. Kind of the old phrase, keep your powder dry until you need it. Well, it, it's got everything it needs. So we did finally leave the IB, and now you know we're going to see if we can keep it. The gap, let's see if that gap has been filled. The gap has been filled, so we have that as well. Both, really, or, or whichever one you want to use, there's always the argument of, should I use the, you know, the 5 o'clock close? Should I use the 4.15 close, the 4 o'clock close? Well, no matter which one of those you use, we, we hit them all, right? So there's no more argument of, well, we still need to close that gap. Nah, it's done. All right, we are above the daily pivot point and looking at the volume, you know, it, it's not as light as price would have me believe that it would have been. And it's within the norm. So, you know, every morning we look at this cumulative volume down here and all it's doing is tallying up the transactions in the overnight hours. It's only the overnight hours. And we're looking for either really extreme volume or really light volume. And when it's neither one of those, then we just turn it off. So we don't need it. It takes up a lot of real estate. All right, so we are still holding above the weekly pivot point. That is an argument that says we should still be looking for long opportunities, but we want to see if we start moving back towards that weekly pivot, right? Because we can still be above it, but falling back to it, at which point we wouldn't want to continue to look for longs, right? We can't say, well, we look for longs when we're above the weekly and then continue to try to go long when we're falling towards that weekly. We are also still above the previous week's high. And that also, that's a inside week breakout. We need to keep it to maintain that bullish posture. It's a little bit of a line in the sand at this point, 37.77. One thing of note, we finally got above that 3,800 though, right? So we've been talking about this range and this box and we're out of it. Finally, finally, finally. So from that August sell-off where we hit our head on the 200 period moving average and we fell back, if you were to throw a fib on that, the 50% retracement is at 39, I'm going to use the cog line, 39.11. This says 39.14. It's close enough. So that 3911 is a cog line. That's COG, it's center of gravity. It's also a measured move location. For this argument of a bear market rally, the move to the upside should not go higher than a certain percentage. All right, so here's that August rejection. Here's the low. If we were using the fib from that rejection to that low, we'd have, you know, like a 50% level. You can kind of use the think or swim quant tool, cut that into four pieces. That way you'd have 75. 25. 
we really don't want to see it get above 75. I mean, in technical terms, it could come all the way back up to that previous level, that 4,300. And as long as it didn't go above that, we'd be all right. But really, 41 half is kind of my line in the sand. I don't want to see this rally get beyond that. We start getting beyond that, and uh, I think we'll start squeezing things that shouldn't be squeezed. So let's start to game it out, right? The market didn't like the earnings, obviously. And if you looked at the numbers or you've read the report or at least read a summary of it, it was more of the going forward part and a large discussion about the dollar. That was Microsoft that had uh, put that in there. There were parts of the company that say, you know, the cloud side that seemed to be doing good. I haven't got a chance to read the whole report on both of those, but it they, they did not come out and say, you know, that, hey, we're, we're running a crap company with a crap product that we can't sustain. Microsoft is not going to go down anytime soon, and neither is Google as a company, right? We're not going to lose them. They're not turning into another Yahoo. But there's still likely to be a little bit of pain and punishment this morning once we get past the knee-jerk reaction of those that want to buy it up at a cheaper price. We've got an ADR at 2.6. We don't have a market maker move, so there's no front end volatility. If we start making that break to the downside, well, I'm going to have to go and I'll have to upload the video to YouTube. Thank you for the heads up on that. I'll end up putting an uploaded version on the YouTube afterwards. So for a move to the downside, breaking back through the do not remove line there and our own Globex low 38.25, the cash open at 38.08, that roundy 3,800, ADR half 37.90, and then we'll be back inside the previous week. And we'll work on 37.39. 37.39, it's 120 points away, basically. And if you're thinking, no, nah, we're not going to go that far. Well, we're just looking at math, right? These numbers say that we can go that far, and it wouldn't even be an outsized move. It wouldn't be uh, unusual, extreme, nothing like that. That would just be like a going to the refrigerator to get a you know, glass of milk. There's nothing. So 3740, just use some round numbers, is easily attainable today. I'm not suggesting we're going there. Just that if we start going down, that's going to be the target we focus on, right? Level by level by level, we'll work our way down to that. take everything the other direction when we had that bad cpi print and the market went down through the morning and then flipped and rallied and came ripping back up right roaring like a mad demon want to talk about the upside move today yes google and microsoft gut punched the market yesterday but it has not continued to fall through the night So we talked about the downside. The upside move would be getting through our own Globex, getting through yesterday's high at 38.75, 38.91, and then the full ADR at 
Now, here's the thing. When it comes to um, linear regression, dot plot statistics, least squared method, um, when things move really fast, they leave a liquidity vacuum behind, right? So one of my concerns this morning is where we left off and the reset. Everybody sees candles here, so they think, oh, there's no gap. There really is. There really is a gap from that big starting point. And what I'm gonna be looking for today is that we slowly grind our way back up there and we close that gap and then we dump. And we've done that before. That's where I learned that, that trick, right? This is not something new that I'm inventing. This is something that I've seen often enough that uh, it should be recognizable to others, right? Does it always happen? No. I mean, you can see, you know, here we dropped off and we rallied right back up to it and you know, we kept on going. It didn't just reset and dump. But when we talk about places where we could turn or where a market is likely to turn, if we continue to rally up through this morning and we get back to where we were when the report hit and the market dumped. I am going to be prepared to see this market turn and flip there and fail there and not just pull back, which is always the argument, right? Oh, is that just a pullback or are we actually changing direction? I won't just be looking for a pullback off of that level before we go higher. I'll be looking for the market to actually have changed structural dynamics at that point and start moving in the other direction. And if it doesn't happen, it's fine. It's not like I'm going to take a trade short as soon as we get there, just because we got there. I'm just going to be ready to go short, ready to change my mind about any long trades and be prepared to take the other side, take it down. And that's the concern this morning, right? I don't even know if we're going to get back up to that spot. But if we do, I'm going to be ready to short and then start tagging through all these levels. We had a really nice cumulative tick yesterday and look how tightly grouped they were. I've been using the word cluster Cluster really seems to fit it well. When we didn't have a green line leader, the green line stayed inside the channel, which to me is a good signal, right? It says, hold the line. What we're doing is gonna stay. It's not aggressive, right? When, when you get a green line breakover in a particular direction and, and it leads the group, that's aggressive flows. But when the green line is maintaining, consider this like a channel, when the green line is maintaining inside the channel and the channel is pointed up, it's just telling you, hey, the bullish flows are, are fine. It's a steady flow. Like when you're standing in a river and the water's just steadily pushing at you, it's not pulsing. It's not coming in waves like the ocean. It's just a steady flow. And that's kind of what I think about when we got this cluster. We had a nice angle to it. Not exactly 45, but you know, a pretty good angle just good, clean, solid flows. It's a good way to think about it. All the way up until noon, and then everything changed. Right, right around that 12, 1230 green line crossover. And at first I thought, oh boy, that, that's it. You know, you get a green line cross like that, and that's usually where we, uh, where we dump it like a brick in water. And that's not what we got. line up those crosshairs again so this chart here is the monsters of tech and the monsters of tech was failing to get through this resistance level that i had marked out it's just bumping its head on it fighting 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 and then it pulled back away from it and we got that green line crossover finance on the other hand was not restricted the way that tech was finance just kept on going all morning long all the way up until that pullback level. But 
it just pulled back. It didn't dump, it didn't crash and burn. Now, neither one of those are the S&P. So we'll put the S&P in there for a moment. Had that kind of um, that rising wedge. And of course, we break to the bottom out of rising wedges. And that's exactly what we got. The, the oddity was it's usually a breakout near the 60% mark or like the 70% mark. This thing kept getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And it went way beyond its breakout point before it finally, finally, finally gave us that breakdown. And it was just a minor breakdown. And we can see that even though that green line rolled over, it stopped. And it just kind of let us know, hey, this was not going to be a reset. You know, don't try to run it to the moon. I gave back a little bit of my profit on that, you know, because I didn't know if the short was going to be momentary, a momentary short or if we were going to go back to where we opened. But when that green line started to stabilize and price stopped falling, I got out of it. And of course, you know, you give a little bit of it back, but I'll give back a little profit and be happy rather than taking a loss. I'm going to continue to point out ways to read this cumulative tick indicator. It's not the end all be all, right? Nothing is. It's just a tool to help confirm or validate what it is that we're seeing out there. So usually the green line crossover tells us that we're going to get a significant change event. And really, I'd say that that signal failed us yesterday. We didn't get that. We did get a pretty good pullback. But that's not enough, right? That's not really what we're looking for. So another thing of note worth talking about is the uh, weighted AD. It did a really good job of getting above that 500 early. And the rest finally got there. Uh, it's interesting to note how we didn't continue to expand through the day. I mean, it, it wasn't aggressive, which kind of kept bringing in that warning. So it wasn't expansive, but it got above the five. It held really good through the afternoon. The distance between these two was really all the, uh, that was really the best signal that it gave yesterday. So you can see, you know, different days where we've managed to get through the five, but it didn't hold. This is all one trading day. We started out, you know, below the zero. We ran up and got above the five. We had that head and shoulders, and then it just failed and rolled back down. Look at how the cyan line was getting hugged and holding tight with those histogram bars that it never really expanded and stood out by itself because the move to the upside was the fake one, right? That was fast, uh, fake breakout, fast failure. I'm going to get that phrase one of these days. Fast breakout. No, nope, fake breakout, fast failure. And, durr. But yeah, look at the conviction on the move to the downside when that line did step away from those histogram bars and showed its leadership, right? It really showed its true colors. So when we got above the five yesterday with that cyan line first and the histograms finally came up behind it and it kept that distance between those two through the day, that gave me more confidence than just getting above the five by itself.
And now that I'm zoomed out onto it, I mean, you can really see how it stands out yesterday. All right, gold took a move to the upside. Bitcoin, strong move to the upside. Significant move right around 4.30. Uh, in gold, it came much earlier. And we got that dollar below 110, which is really good. Just perfect timing yesterday, right? That we talked about the dollar yesterday. We talked about those levels, laid out the benchmarks for what we would want to see and what we would expect to see if the dollar got below, say, 105 and then you know 111, 110. That was good timing to have that discussion yesterday. We're at the 110 now. Kind of need to have a different discussion. That 110 in the dollar is kind of a major level right now. Call it the Dixie, right? Because it's not really the dollar. Um, it, it's not the US dollar. It's a collection of different currencies. But uh, either way, we're at, we're at that 110 point. All right, and it, it really needs to hold this level. We can wick through it and we can, on the day, we can go below it. But on the week, this is one of those levels that needs to hold for the, for the, the current technical analysis that's on the table to hold, right? Like this is um, an all year long thing. Strong dollar, continued push to the upside, and um, ending the year somewhere around 120, 125. And make no mistake about it, the dollar at 120, 125, it's going to break stuff. It's breaking stuff now. It's one of the reasons that Google and Microsoft didn't have a good earnings. It's the dollar. And we're not at 120 yet. Heck, we're not above that 115 yet. So even though we're not at those highs that we've been looking for all year, there's also lows that need to hold. And getting back below 110 would kind of break what the, the, current, consens con the current belief is, consensus. There's a, I need more coffee. So let's game it out. What if we break below that 110? What is that going to do? And why is it so important? Well, we're likely to begin a bit of a parabolic move in the S&P and the NASDAQ upwards if we see this 110 break. Now, again, just going below it's not enough. Closing below it on the week would be a whole different story. I wanted to come out to the weekly and make sure I hadn't missed a gap that needed to be marked. I didn't. They're all fine. So we want to let this play out through the week. You really want to keep your eye on it on the daily. I am expecting that we could possibly get below it, kind of wick around down there and come back up. But I'm also expecting that if you look at what happened with US dollar China, US dollar Japan, even US dollar Canada, those three pairs are down. And I mean, China is really down. And the dollar is down. Europe's up and the British pound is up.
So that's going to have a large impact on what's going on here with the dollar. If we get below 110 today, and we're talking about, you know, just intraday price action moving around. If we get down below that today, flip over to the VIX. Make sure in the correlated market state that the VIX also breaks down below, we'll call it $28. Now you put those two together, VIX below 28, the dollar below 110, the recovery in the retrace from what happened last night with Microsoft and Google it should be nothing more than you know a bad dream. It would be smoke and mirrors, poof, gone. If these two drop below those levels, the S&P and NASDAQ is going to rally. We wouldn't expect that rally to stick if we don't close the week below 28 and below 110. So that's kind of a big deal, you know, in, in the longer run, but just for today. So dollar below 110, if the VIX begins moving up and that dollar is still moving down, you know that they are finally breaking apart from each other, right? Decouple is the word to use there. So you can kind of see that structure, right? Where they're working together. Now, if we go to the VIX futures, which is what I like to use anyways, they both had that sell off yesterday, right? Pretty obvious, pretty simple. But the dollar had that breakdown in the kill zone last night between two and four, and the VIX did not have that breakdown last night. So that's the decouple that we're talking about. This is volatility on energy. And that is a really, really, really small print. We're at a critical low. Keep your eye on volatility. Looks like, or keep your eye on crude, on oil. It looks like we're going into a volatility squeeze. For the S&P and the NASDAQ, if this move down continues this morning, you can use the three period moving average for your short trigger. And you can see that that's the yellow line here. We get below it and rally back up. We get below it and rally back up. But we're going to be looking for the rollover, right? The rollover for if all of this does begin to fail. We've got VIX basing. We're going to be looking for the VIX to cross that three period moving average, make a break to the upside, starting with an inside day breakout around 29 and a half. Should be combined with a strong rally in the dollar off of that 10, off of that 110 area. Very likely might be accompanied with oil breaking out that'd be seeing oil get above 87 and and breaking out of this really big wick day
and we'll be looking for euro US dollar drop back below parity, British pound US dollar drop back below 114. And then the 10 year yield. We want to see this pick back up and break the high that's been set 43.30. Uh, seeing this get above 44 with the dollar bouncing off that 110 and making a run to the upside of VIX with an inside day breakout. All of those will start to line up, right? And that would be the S&P and the NASDAQ rolling over and continuing to make that strong move lower, right? We're talking about the S&P closing that gap and dumping down with all of these triggers starting to fire off. Right, so the S&P continuing to grind, making its way up here to that 3870, getting that gap closed and starting to dump with the dollar rising, the yields rising, VIX spiking up through those levels and the pair groups coming into play. We wanna see a very high correlation coefficient in the advancing and declining issues with a strong green line to the downside. I'm gonna to try to flip this. I don't know if it'll do it with the indicator. No, it didn't flip it. But it would basically be that same cluster in reverse, right? But it. It probably won't happen right at the open. It might take a little bit of time. For the correlation coefficient, you know, normally in the morning briefing, I go over and we look at uh, trading view and we look at how many names are up this morning, how many are down. That's correlation, right? When we're looking at 100 names in the NASDAQ and 70 of them are up more than 1%, we're looking at a correlation coefficient. But if you don't have trading view, you can look at it on Thinkorswim. You go to the Visualize tab and go to the Index Watch. You can see when we're correlated in a highly correlated market state, when the index that you're looking at has everything advancing or everything declining all at once, everything. When a market is highly correlated or in a correlated market state like that, it is when it's the most dangerous. It's when it can make the biggest outsized moves. Yesterday, we had the NASDAQ running at like a 92 at some point yesterday. And that, that's a pretty correlated market state. But we're not talking about 92 or 95. We're talking about 99 or 100. So you can pick your watch list. Just go in and, you know, they're alphabetized. So you can choose the NASDAQ 100 or the S&P 100. They are detachable and stackable. So you can detach them, shrink them up, overlay them on those grids. And we're going through all these steps and talking about this this morning because we're kind of trying to game it out, right? I find it really unlikely that we're going to hold the line today. Although, you know, the earnings that we've had are not the only earnings on the block this week that can really shake things up.
my $97 put on Google just might be in the money today if it can if it can wake up and continue to dump. All right, names in the NASDAQ that are up at least a half of a percent. We've got 14 of them. And a number of them are China names. PDD, Baidu. Those are not sustainable long opportunities. I mean, obviously, we can trade them to the upside on an intraday basis, sure. But I wouldn't still stress caution on those. For anybody who wants to swing them along, be ready to defend those things because, you know, I, I don't think the China moves, those ADR plays are going to work out in your favor, right? So uh, paper hands, be ready to get out of that stuff. So that's the long side on the NASDAQ. Let's flip it over and see what the, the negative side of things are. 41 names in the NASDAQ are down at least a half of a percent this morning. And it's just about across the board, right? Nothing really stands out on a particular sector, name, or industry. How many are down a full 1%? 32. That's not that bearish, really. Now, for the S&P, 16 names are up this morning. Old school um, tobacco, oil and gas, some restaurants. And again, nothing really stands out here. Except that these remind me of more of like defensive plays. Well, let's flip it over. How many are down at least a half of a percent? 19. Now, the difference between the S&P and the NASDAQ, the number one difference that always stands out is that the NASDAQ 100 does not have financial names in it. So when you're looking at those two indexes and they're divergent like they are this morning, they're very divergent this morning. To me, I always gravitate to, okay, well, what are the financials doing? Remember yesterday, the financials were doing really good and tech was just hitting its head and couldn't get through that resistance. And I need to address that real quick. Um, yesterday, we had a really good advanced decline line, right? I mean, we were sitting in, there's 100 names. And look, we had 93 out of 100 advancing. So very strong market breadth, really high advanced decline line. And yet, what when we say tech, and we refer to tech, we're always talking about the, the NY Fang. That's not tech. It's the monsters of tech. So what this was telling us yesterday is that the monsters of tech weren't doing anything. They stalled out and just couldn't get anywhere. And everything else did the work. And that's not normal, right? Normally, monsters of tech carry the market and everything else just gets dragged along whether they like it or not. So yesterday, the monsters of tech put their feet up in the recliner and just chilled for the day and let the rest of the market do all the work. And that's fine when the monsters aren't doing anything and they just chill. The rest of the market can carry the market. But if the monsters are down and the rest of the market wants to go up, we're going to get a very violent, very choppy, hard to trade kind of day. Because that divergence will just be chaos in the candles. There won't be a solid trend to stick with. There won't be a narrative or a story to run on. And we won't know who to follow, right? Are we supposed to be long or are we supposed to be short? Are we supposed to follow what group? It's two-sided trading at its finest. 
But if everything coalesces and everything starts moving in the same direction, the entire breadth and scope of the marketplace up or down, we can see some real violence today. Names in the S&P that are down more than 1%, only 12, and that's not very much. And of course, three of those are Microsoft and Google, because you know we got Google twice. But I see a lot of other monsters of tech in there. Tesla, NVIDIA, Amazon, Facebook, that's a lot of monsters of tech. So it won't matter if the rest of the market wants to go up. Yesterday, these names were just chilling and they weren't pushing the market up or down, but now they're going to be pushing down. So what I got for you guys, be careful, be safe, watch the correlations, and I will see you all tomorrow.